In this video, we're going to talk about when the stratosphere gets nasty and touch on what I do for my PhD. Now, if you didn't catch the previous video on the stratospheric polar vortex, you can check that out over here, or if you just like a refresher. And I'd highly recommend that you do watch that video because we're going to be carrying right on from where we left off last time. So last time we characterised the polar vortex as this big mass of rotating air over the Earth's poles, which traps freezing air at high latitudes. And it varied in strength, so the stronger the polar vortex, the better constrained that cold air was. Whereas if the vortex were to grow weaker, then there's a greater chance of that ultra-cold air escaping down to the lower latitudes. Now, we can get a measure of how strong the polar vortex is by using something called the Arctic Oscillation Index which is actually a measure of surface pressure over the Arctic and um, is more complicated than I'm making out to be. But let's just leave it at that for now. The important thing is that if the AO index is positive, then the vortex is strong and the cold air is well constrained to high latitudes, whereas if the AO index is negative, then the vortex is anomalously weak and so there's a greater chance of cold air spilling out. I bring this up now because it's going to be useful later on in the video, but just remember that the AO index is a measure of vortex strength and it has to do with the surface pressure at the Arctic. For now, let's go back to answering a slightly more fundamental question. We've talked about the fact that the vortex varies in strength, but we haven't asked the question of why it varies in strength on short timescales. We already talked about the fact that the temperature gradient from the equator to the pole controls the strength of the vortex and ultimately when it breaks up. but it's variations on a shorter temporal scale, so variations over shorter periods of time, depends on another kind of wave that we haven't talked about yet. Gravitational waves. This sound is very physics stuff's complicated, right? Gravitational waves are a hideously complicated subject that I can't claim to fully understand. But what you need to know for this video is this. Waves transmit momentum in exactly the same way that a physical object like a ball, which is moving, transmits its momentum by moving from one place to another. And if you've ever been on the beach and felt a water wave break on you, you'll know that the fact that it transmits momentum is true. You can feel a really substantial force pushing on you when it breaks. And in exactly the same way that there are water waves on the surface of the ocean, which are kept in check by the Earth's gravity, there are also waves in the Earth's atmosphere kept in check by the Earth's gravity. They're just a lot more difficult to see. And while water waves are caused by wind blowing on the surface of the ocean, and that force is counteracted by gravity pulling downwards, atmospheric waves are much bigger in scale, and so they tend to be caused by much bigger things, like the rotation of the Earth and mountain ranges displacing air upwards. But in exactly the same way as water waves, gravitational waves in the atmosphere also transmit momentum. And when they break, they deposit their momentum wherever they happen to have propagated to. And because of a few geometric factors, if gravitational waves in the atmosphere break near the polar vortex, they deposit their momentum in such a way that it acts to slow the vortex down. It basically acts as a brake on the system. And this happens all the time. What can vary, though, is how much of it happens at a given time. Because if enough momentum is deposited in this way, then the vortex can be slowed right down to a halt. It can even reverse direction. And when that happens, we get a pretty significant event. In response to a huge amount of braking force from atmospheric waves, the polar vortex tends to do one of two things. It either gets displaced from the pole, or it splits into two smaller daughter vortices. But in either case, what we see accompanying this event is a very sudden and very significant warming of the polar stratosphere. And when I say very sudden, we're talking over the scale of a few days, but on the scale of something as big as the polar vortex, that's pretty sudden. And when I say very significant, we're talking 20, 30, 40, even 50 degrees Celsius of warming. These are colossally violent events, and they're called sudden stratospheric warmings. Although I prefer the original name in the scientific literature, they were originally called explosive warmings, which sounds way cooler, but it's kind of less accurate. The warming part of the event comes from a rapid descent of stratospheric air, which then adiabatically warms, and that's caused by the vortex slowing down all of a sudden. And having the stratosphere be much warmer and less mobile than it used to be has all kinds of implications for how air in the stratosphere moves around. But it also has a lot of interesting implications for how air in our layer of the atmosphere, in the troposphere, behaves. 
Remember the Arctic Oscillation Index that we talked about at the start of the video that was a measure of vortex strength and we form by looking at the pressure at the surface in the Arctic? Well, instead of looking at the pressure at the surface, we could equally be looking at the pressure at any layer in the atmosphere, a kilometre above the surface, for example, or five kilometres or 20 kilometres. And we could construct an Arctic Oscillation Index for any height that we so chose, which would give us a measure of how strong the polar vortex's influence is at that height. Kind of. I'm simplifying, but bear with me. Now, a few years ago, my supervisor did this and looked at how the Arctic Oscillation Index varied at different heights in the atmosphere after extreme events in the stratosphere like sudden stratospheric warmings. And what he found was this. There seems to be a descending influence from the stratosphere into the troposphere, lagged over time, of the sudden stratospheric warming. And in subsequent scientific papers, it was found that this descending influence impacted surface weather in a few different ways, such as where Atlantic storms tended to make landfall in Europe. And this was significant because up until this finding, it was generally thought that the stratosphere, which is much less massive than the bulky troposphere, didn't influence surface weather at all. In fact, it was the other way around. The troposphere would do things and the stratosphere would react to it. It was like a lid to our atmospheric circulation. It wasn't really thought to be that important for weather prediction. But this result, and the subsequent papers that followed on from it, showed that that wasn't really the case, and that, at least in the aftermath of extreme events like sudden stratospheric warmings, the stratosphere did have an influence on our surface weather. So, as we talked about in the second video, if we can understand how the stratosphere influences the troposphere, then we can use stratospheric information, which tends to be much more predictable than the troposphere, to create better surface weather forecasts and look further into the future with greater reliability. Ha! <laughs> uh, good question. At the moment, this is the frontier of our knowledge. There are a few theories flying around which explain how the stratosphere can influence the troposphere, mostly involving a complex variable called potential vorticity and how that changes in response to sudden stratospheric warmings. But there is no one concrete theory which has been proven against data, and so there's no one concrete way to improve our surface weather forecasts. My PhD involves me testing two such theories against one another, the downward control hypothesis and the plunger hypothesis, which I've had a fairly large role in mathematically expressing, and seeing which one of them, if either of them, does a good job of predicting tropospheric anomalies in the aftermath of these extreme stratospheric events and how we can use that hypothesis to improve our surface weather forecasts. At the moment though, it's too soon to say if either of the theories will perform well, and it's entirely possible that everyone in the field is barking up the wrong tree. But in the next couple of years, I hope to at least get a partial answer to stratosphere-troposphere coupling, or at least to thin down the possibilities of what to consider, though most likely it's going to be several years before this particular conundrum is solved completely. So in this video we went really deep into the stratosphere and looked at how and why the polar vortex varies in strength and how we measure that strength using the Arctic Oscillation Index. We looked at how gravity waves deposit momentum and slow the polar vortex. We looked at the sudden warmings that, that the deposition of momentum causes, and also looked at how the stratosphere influences the troposphere and the ongoing mystery of how that happens, and a little bit about how my PhD tries to answer that question. Next time, we're going to take several steps back and start looking at the atmosphere on a global scale again, looking at the physics behind global warming and climate change, and why carbon dioxide is the hottest compound around. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to support me and this series, then you can do so on this course's CONOS page, which also gives you a greater educational framework and can, you can track how far through this course you are. And if you did enjoy the video, then please do like it and consider subscribing to this channel for more educational content. Okay, so here's my workbook. It's important because it's a book, and I like books, and it's got my work in. That's my laptop, which has got the scripts for the Crash Course videos in. That's my Japanese piece, Lily. Always important to keep that around because it keeps the air oxygenated. 